Welcome. I wanted to let you know about a little conundrum we have. Evidently, it was um, listed incorrectly in the program for last night's dress rehearsal and said that this would start at 7.30. So I would like, with your permission, I would like to wait 10, 15 minutes. Um, so in case some people do start coming, that, you know. Otherwise, I can just do it twice. <laughs> yeah, we can have a little rehearsal while we're here. Where are my sopranos? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, you know, not me, but somebody might. So, um, and for those listening in the live stream, we'll get started about 7.15, I think. Okay. Thanks for your patience. I wanted to let you know that because of your um, patience, we're going to reward you, and we've uncovered the cookies. <laughs> so feel free, go get yourself a cookie, get yourself some tea, some water, and fill that, fill that space with some food.
Welcome. We'll try. We'll give this another go. Um, can you hear me if I'm talking like this? Can everyone hear you? Hear me in the back of the room? Okay. Well, good. So the plan for this evening is hopefully talk no more than 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, and then ask for questions. Um, I'll start out by telling you the three purposes of my sabbatical research. I had three goals going into my sabbatical research. And if you're not aware, this presentation is sort of a what did I do on my sabbatical type thing, okay? Um, the first thing, the first goal was to outline the various um, editions of Messiah that are out there right now, current editions, in an attempt to choose one edition for us to use in the future. The current edition that we use was, I think it's 1902 was the first printing of it. And it's, uh, you'll hear more about the different editions and stuff, but there's editions out there like we use that use trombones and, and French horns and um, trumpets on more things than they did originally. And then there's the versions of it that Handel would have done during his lifetime. Although there is some speculation he may have used French horns in some of his performances. And I'll get, I'll get to that later. I'm not saying that just because I'm a French horn player. <laughs> the, second, uh, the second goal was to um, begin gathering information about the beginnings of the Bethany Oratorio Society and its yearly performances of Messiah. Um, the, the, idea is, the idea was this is the history of the work itself, and this is the history from Bethany's perspective and from Lindsborg's perspective. Um, and then finally, the third goal was to make connections for a choir tour that we're taking in May. So May 1 to May 13, um, 50 members of the, of the choir and some alumni and some uh, parents are going to Ireland, England, and Sweden. And those are the three places that I went on my sabbatical. So we're going to get to go to in Ireland where uh, it was first premiered. And we're going to get to go to London. The house on the left, the White House, is the Handel House. And this is where he lived. But before he was a, um, a citizen of um, Britain, he um, rented that house. And then when he became a dual citizen, he had, now he had the rights to own property. And he bought that same house and lived there for, I guess, the rest of his life. Um, but he wrote Messiah in this house in London. The premiere was in Dublin. So, um, a little bit about the composition itself. Um, the composition took place a little over three weeks during the summer of 1741, 24 days to be exact. And some people thought, oh, there, you know, there, he's been touched by God, there's this religious, you know, there must be something for him to be able to do it that fast, but truly that's just how he worked. He was just th that fast with this stuff. Plus, he recycled a lot of material. And when I say recycle, I'm being kind. Um, he, he stole stuff. He definitely stole stuff. He, he mostly stole from himself. Okay, so if you can think of the four choruses, and this is where it's nice to have this audience. I was, I've, I've been thinking all week that how nervous I was because there's going to be people in this room that know more about some of this than I do, even after I did this research. Because you've, if you've sung it, for 50 years, then you've sung it almost 100 times, right? And so, um, but now I can talk numbers and titles, and most of you will know. If you don't know, then I apologize. Um, so the four choruses that were really virtuosic, the ones that have melismas, those choruses were originally written for soprano, solo, or duet. And so they were virtuosic. And he was like, I need a chorus. <laughs> I need a chorus. I'll just steal from myself. And so the four are uh, number seven, he shall purify. Number 12, for unto us a child is born. Number 21, his yoke is easy. And 26, all we like sheep. Somehow he reworked all of those from his own compositions to make it for a chorus. So let's see here. This is the interior. This is the interior of the Handel House. Um, this is actually the building, the music hall, a rendering of the music hall where it was first. Ooh, yeah, you can see better now. 
Um, this is um, a rendering of the music hall. And in its place now is this courtyard with a really strange, <coughs> a really strange, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, sculpture, yes, thank you. I'm losing my mind here. Um, so the performing forces were taken from, there's two major churches, in, I mean, there's a lot of churches in, in Dublin, Ireland, right? But the two main churches were Christ Church Cathedral and St. Patrick's Cathedral. And they used choristers from both of those places. The first performance was around 32 singers, I believe, and probably at least that many players. I was saying the other day to someone that when 25 years after he died, they had a handle commemoration in Westminster Abbey and had 500 performers. And 250 of them were singers and 250 of them were players. Now, can you imagine nowadays 250 singers trying to sing over 250 players? I mean, you'd have to, you know, Anne wouldn't like that. She'd be getting a hand the whole time, you know, to play softer. But, uh, so yeah, um, the first performance was in Dublin on April 13th, 1742. And this would have been about two weeks after Easter. The speculation is that he had not so much success in London the season before, and he was happy to accept an invitation in Dublin because that would be kind of off the beaten path a little bit, and maybe he could work stuff out before he brought it back to London. And it was a huge hit in Dublin, very big, hit, to the point where um, if you bought a ticket, you also got a ticket to uh, the dress rehearsal, and they had to uh, make an announcement for the ladies to not wear their hoop skirts, the hoops in their skirts, and the men to not bring sabers <laughs> so that there would be more room in the hall so that more people could be in there. Okay. Here's a bronze right outside of uh, that area that says, this bronze commemorates the first performance of George Baird of Handel's Oratorio Messiah given in the old music hall in Fishamble Street at noon, at noon, I didn't even see that before, at noon on Tuesday, April 13th. What did I say? I said, yeah, April 13th. Um, I, like I was saying, the performing forces were taken from those two main churches, one of which the Bethany Choir will be performing in on tour. We're uh, performing at the Christ Church Cathedral for their noonday concerts and uh, it's a really an honor to be allowed to do that, so we're excited about that. Um, a total of approximately 40 singers, I think I said 32, but between 32 and 40 with soloists singing with the choir. So every soloist, they didn't, they didn't sit and then get up and sing their thing. They sang, for unto us a child is born, and then came and sang their solos. And you know, It was pretty common at the time to do that. Um, orchestration for the original version, um, actually the orchestration didn't change significantly throughout his life. It was strings plus oboes on one thing, trumpets on one, two, three things, and timpani on two. So he did have trumpets, he did have oboes, he did have um, uh, oboes and uh, Trumpets, oboes, and what did I say? Sorry, I'm just losing it. Um, now, important to this story are that the two main copyists, so understand at the time there weren't Xerox machines, right? And so he paid someone to take his scribblings, which his scribblings are scribblings. I mean, it's really, I saw a facsimile of the original score, and then I saw the one he conducted from at the original performance. and. You'll see, you'll see some from, um, from the conductor's score. His score, I'm not sure he, he could read it. Um, so his main copyists were um, John Christopher Schmidt, who changed his name to Smith. See, they were both in Germany. Both Handel and Schmidt were in Germany and were basically kind of called to come to London to um, perform and do things. And so he brought Schmidt with him who they later named his, cha changed his name to Smith um, as his copyist. So he would take his scribblings and give it to Smith, and Smith would try to decipher it and, and, and put it in. And that's why, like, anytime you see something that's maybe a mistake, it really could have been a mistake. 
I mean, it very well could have been because it wasn't until, I think, 1764. He died in 1759, and uh, I think it was 1764 was the first time it was published, that there was a published score. Um, so the two main were John Christopher Smith, Sr., and John Christopher Smith, Jr., and that's important for later. Um, the performance history, initial success in Dublin, Initial sex, success in Dublin, but not in London. Um, he got back to London the next year, I think, 1743 or 1744, and put it on at, in Covent Garden, and it was not successful. Um, he wrote it for the stage. He did not write it for church. And the people from church couldn't get over that it was in a theater, and the theater people weren't ex excited about a sacred work on their stage. And so it just didn't take hold. Um, it wasn't until um, the first performance at the Foundling Hospital in 1749. This is the Foundling Hospital in probably the 1960s before it was torn down. Um, the Foundling Hospital was an orphanage for children whose parents couldn't afford them. And today there's a museum on the site that holds a whole lot of the um, original manuscripts and things that Handel left in the codicil to his will to the foundling hospital. But it's interesting, the, the parallel, because it became popular again once it was a fundraiser. Okay, So if you think about the history of Bethany College, they did five performances the first Holy Week. Five. I think, I'm not going to be able to remember them all, but Salina, McPherson, Lindsborg, Fremont, and Salemsburg, I think. And, of course, how'd they travel there? They weren't getting in cars, right? So they literally did five full performances that first week, and they made, I think, $246, which I did the, I did the inflation calculator, and it, it, it's about $6,000 in today's money they made to help subsidize Bethany Academy. So, so at, at uh, Foundling Hospital, they asked him to come in in 1749 and do this um, charity performance. Well, now because it was in a chapel at the Foundling Hospital, I think uh, the next picture is probably that's a rendering of the inside of the chapel at the Foundling Hospital. Um, because it was a fundraiser and because it was in a chapel, all of a sudden it was really popular and became popular. And he really owed the success of the work in the world probably to the Foundling Hospital. And that's why he, he did, I think, six more performances at the Foundling Hospital um, throughout his life. In fact, here's one I get asked a lot. Is it true that someone, that the king stood up during a hallelujah chorus? What do you think? Yes or no? No. <laughs> uh, it for sure wasn't a king. They speculate that it might have been the prince and princess of Wales at one of the attendances of the, the first foundling uh, hospital performance in 1749 that the prince of Wales stood up, and that's where it started. Still royalty, just not the king. Um, so I was talking about the French horns. There's actually a... Uh, well, you can't really read that very well. you want. Um, and I don't have a picture of it, but I did see a listing um, at the Foundling Hospital of um, who got paid, an original listing, who got paid and what they got paid. And so, for example, some of the soloists waived their fee. Hear that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, some of the soloists waived their fee, but there were f two French horns paid for that performance. And it's on the ledger that two French horns were paid for that performance. And some people think that it might have been doubling the trumpets at octaves. But still, I mean, they have all the parts, the orchestra parts there as well, and there's no French horn part. So, you know, speculation, I guess. It wasn't until a repeat performance at the hospital in 1750 that Messiah began to receive the notoriety for which it is now known. He did six performances at the Foundling Hospital during his lifetime, and he made arrangements to leave considerable gifts to the hospital 
on his death in 1759. Here's the codicil to his will. You can't read it because my fat fingers are in the creating that shadow there when I was taking the picture. But uh, that's what the codicil to his will looks like. And here's the official thing saying um, he was giving a lot of his works to the Foundling Hospital. And as I said, the Foundling Hospital has become now a museum and a research center. And I got to go there, and there'll be some pictures here in a second I'll show you, that uh, he, um, um, where he left all of his stuff to um, the Foundling Hospital. All right, let's see what we got next. Okay, here's another question. How many of you can name that piece? Huh? Yeah, it says it on there, so you could you could probably guess with yeah. Um, so this comes from, I believe this is from his first um, the first performance conducting copy. So J. C. Smith, Senior would have done this, but you can see in the upper left hand corner that's his handwriting listed the names of the performers, which is really helpful to you know, researchers because it says basically who he had as performers at, at these things. So, All right, there are approximately 16 or 17 copies that would be considered to be tacitly approved by Handel. It would have been copies in his lifetime that he would have seen. And so some of them are more valuable than others because of what they, uh, what they bring and what's different about them. Um, so, for example, the autograph score is entirely in his hand, and it's thought that a performance of this score never took place in Handel's lifetime because he changed things to fit his performers so often. So that scribbling first copy that was then made into a, um, a regular copy that you can see here um, was, um, what was I going to say? I'm losing my mind. I'm sorry, guys. I shouldn't have a three-hour rehearsal the day before, you know. But uh, um, no, it, it, we, we, thought, we, we think that that's never been performed like it has. Because even at the first performances, I'm going to tell you some of the other things that are um, kind of indi indicative of um, his changes. But he would raise, he was despised at a fifth because he liked the soprano. And he wanted the soprano to sing it. Or the alto wasn't good enough. And so he, it's not our case. It's not our case at all. Right? But uh, um, how beautiful are the feet? There were like four different versions of how beautiful are the feet. And the most popular one, the one that he liked the most, because we don't do the sound has gone out. We haven't sung that one here since I've been here. But it's right after how beautiful are the feet. And in his copy, he made that an, how beautiful are the feet an alto duet for two male altos, in fact, castrati singers, along with a B section of the, the sound goes out and then would come back and repeat the A section of How Beautiful Are the Feet. So tons of changes, just whatever he had. If he had, um, now, not orchestrally. Orchestrally, he kept pretty much the same forces throughout. Okay? And that was a later, a later addition by Mozart and by Prout and these other people that they added the trombones and the you know, French horns and things. Um, one of the things that I think is so interesting is, because I didn't know this, and, and I guess a lot of people knew it, and I just didn't know it, was um, that uh, it has an original performance, the original um, of Rejoice Greatly. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice greatly. Oh, well, she did just have Gracie sing it. She's right here. You want to do it? Okay. Um, that was originally in 12-8. So if you don't know what I mean by that, Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice greatly. And it would become one, two, three, four. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice greatly. Now, I'm not doing it perfectly. Right? But you can even YouTube um, Rejoice Greatly in 12.8, and you can find recordings. And they're beautiful. I mean, beautiful. Uh, some year we should do it in 12.8 here. Um, another copy is the Hamburg copy, and uh, this is the one, it's important because he was despised as transposed uh, a fifth higher for soprano instead of alto, 
Um, it contains evidence that he shall feed his flock was sung by two male altos. He had, these, he had one uh, male alto that he really liked named Gaetano Guadani. And he, any time he could use him, he, he used him. Uh, so, um, he shall feed his flock was sometimes sung by two male altos. There's also evidence that but who may abide and he was despised were cut at some point in the use of this edition. So, again, if he didn't have the singers or the players or whatever, he just cut it. It's no big deal. You know? um, there's the Marsh Matthews copy, and maybe I ought to... This is the Archbishop Marsh Library that's connected to St. Patrick's, Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And their copy that's on display there in the library, I, I just called and said, hey, I'm doing this research. And they said, well, you know, this is very... Blah, blah, blah. And then I started telling them about the tradition that we have and things like that. And they're, oh, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Well, why don't you come on down? And so I came on down and she took... <laughs> Without her boss's approval, she took it out of the case and let me kind of thumb through it. Um, the the thing um, that's important about this one, let's see which one is this. this is, that's the overture. This is the uh, Archbishop Marsh copy, and that's the overture. He would. This was copied not by Smith but by John Matthews, another copyist at the time. But it was known to be approved by Handel. But the thing that makes this famous is this. See that little fold out there? Of course, like I said, they, didn't, they couldn't just print and print again, you know. So he had added a little thing on there wh that made But Who May Abide a six measure, I think, recit. Just because, you know. So, um, yeah. And then there's the foundling copy. That's the foundling, uh, one of the uh, things from the foundling copy. Can anyone name that one, Genevieve? Yeah, it's Trumpet Shall Sound, right? Okay, so this copy was given upon his death to the Foundling Hospital, now the Foundling Museum. The museum owns a copy of the codicil to his will in which he leaves the music score to them. The score looks more like a modern score since he had years to decide on what changes he wanted to make from the autograph copy. The Foundling Museum also has a copy of the orchestral parts and a list of those who were paid for the performances, including French horns, like I mentioned. Okay, so here's a little side story. So it's, uh, it's a Saturday, I think it was a Saturday in London, and I'm trying to get some work done, and there's this Travis and Emery bookstore that has um, um, rare antique books and things, and it speci specializes in music. So, of course, I go and I say, give me everything you got on Handel's Messiah. And there were three books, right? And one of the books was one that I had, was on the verge of bringing with me from here, um, a Bethany-owned copy. And then I thought, no, I, if I lose it and this and that, and I can, I can use it when I get back. And so I got it, and here it is. It's called Handel's Messiah, Origins, Composition, and Sources by Jens Peter Larsen, um, a professor in the 50s. This was published 57, I think, 1957. And uh, he was a musicologist at the University of Copenhagen and specialized in Handel. So I say, okay, um, I'll take this book because, you know, I wanted, I wanted to have it on this trip anyway. And I go and I sit down. Oops. And I sit down at a, co at a coffee shop. Like in a, if you've ever been to London, Leicester Square, where you get the half-price tickets for the theater, has a, a lot of little places out there. And I just, it was just a wonderful, nice day where I could just sit outdoors and I could read about Handel and these things. And so I opened this book. And inside were personal letters from Jens Peter Larson, the author, to someone else. And you can see this here. And I'm going to have this up here later that people can look at. But basically, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically, I bought the book. I looked at these notes. I didn't, couldn't really make a lot of the notes. I didn't know who they were talking about. Um, you can see that someone had used this book and was looking through scores 
It turns out there was a, a, a librarian at the British Museum. In that time, all things were kept at the British Museum. Now they're separated and they're at the British Library. So, um, but they had, a, um, they had a guy who was working night shift or whatever at the library and he just got curious and he, and he started becoming a Handel scholar. And he was, uh, um, I think his name was, what was it, William, William Smith? No, his name was James Smith. And he wrote a colleague of his saying, Many thanks for your note. I am sad to have missed you. I was in the student's room from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. working my way through the foundling Messiah parts, which are at the uh, something for binding or boxing or something. I am practically certain about the identity of the copyists. Numbers 7, 14, 15, 20, 23, and 25 are by the elder J.C. Smith. And this is only important because... <laughs> This is Catherine and Colin, and they were awesome, and they were so nice to me. Like, literally all that stuff out on the table are different editions of Handel's Messiah. And they, they own a ton of them. They own all the modern editions. They, they have the, the best Handel scholars in the world come there. Christopher Hogwood has um, done a version of the Foundling Hospital um, Messiah. Um, Donald Burroughs. Donald Burroughs is like probably the expert right now in Handel's Messiah in the world. And I had an opportunity to have coffee with him. And, uh, but the reason that this is important is because I was in the Foundling Hospital and they said, here's our copy. They said, and I said, oh, J so J.C. Smith did that. And they said, no, we don't know. And I said, well, actually... And I pulled this out, and they, and they went, why do you have that? <laughs> and the next thing I knew, it was about an hour of this. <laughs> so they, uh, um, they were very excited to hear that they could authenticate a score that they already had. And they were like, they, they told me, listen, this is something you leave in your will to people. This is, this is something that you need to hold on to, because this is very valuable. Um, which, you know, I'm a little disappointed because the, the book cover tore as I was bringing it over here. But that's right. I'll have it up here for people to look at. This is the British Library, and that's where I spent a lot of my time. And, uh, um, oh, I, I didn't tell you about the um, one last copy of the, um, uh, one of the original editions was the Goldschmidt copy. Now, is anyone in here no, ever heard of Otto Goldschmidt? You have. Do you know who he was married to? Jenny Lind. She was Madame um, Goldschmidt, and she sang all sorts of performances. In fact, the British Library has one of her personal scores that I got to go through, and I took pictures of every page just about, but definitely pictures of where it said... Um, what she did on, you know, cadenzas and things like that, her notes. And in that edition, it was in 1864, later in the 1800s, right? Um, that edition had, but thou didst not leave for soprano. It's a tenor solo, but had it for soprano printed, so. And she even made a note of it saying, in Handel's score, this was originally for tenor. But. All right. So... Other discrepancies in editions. Um, this picture that you're seeing now is from uh, Westminster Abbey. So in 1784, which would be 25 years after his death, uh, they had a Handel commemoration. And at that commemoration, they had 500 performers, like I mentioned it to you, that 250 singers, 250 s players. And this is only 25 years after his death. And they're already starting to do these big mass performances. Um, but first, I want to tell you about some other discrepancies, because I think some of you will find this interesting. You know, the final amen in the tenor in Worthy, right after the sopranos hit the high A and then the tenors hit the high A, it wasn't originally a high A. It was an octave lower. <laughs> he didn't feel, honestly, he didn't feel it was dramatic enough, and so he wanted to make it more dramatic. Um, 
I learned that since by man came death, it was almost always during that time and through the 1800s, almost always performed with the soloists alone singing the initial a cappella part at the beginning, and then the whole chorus coming in after that. Um, surely, the, you know, the 24, 25, and 26, you know how I rehearsed them straight through, basically with just a, barely a pause in between? Well, I found out that uh, those three were originally tended to be sung without pause to the point where there weren't even double bars for the next piece or, or new clefts. It just went right on. Um, this is interesting. The pastoral symphony was originally only 11 measures. And there's, there's evidence that in later performances he left out the rest purposely so that by the end of his life he was only performing 11 measures of pastoral symphony. Um, many of the changes he made were for his favorite countertenor, a castrati named Gaetano Guadani. In one instance, when Guadani wasn't available, trans he transposed it up a fifth so the soprano could sing it. Why do the nations in the Dublin score, it indicates a cut before the kings of the earth rise up, and then made that section arrest it, instead of uh, going on with the version. Uh, there were many versions of How Beautiful, inc you know, including one for alto duet that also incorporates the sound has gone out as part of the aria. Um, All We Like Sheep in its first form was in Italian and was a duet for Princess Caroline and someone and was written about a month before Messiah. And then for whatever reason he said, well, I need a chorus, so All We Like Sheep it is. Okay. Now we get into some of the other notable performances, and I want to make sure of my time here. Okay, I got to I got to go quicker. Um, okay. um, 1767 is when the uh, first published score appeared, and then all of a sudden, people all over were performing it. Okay, there just wasn't the accessibility before that, but once it was printed, then they could do it. Um, uh, we saw the picture of the commemoration of Handel at Westminster Abbey. Um, but in the mid-19th century, now picture this, now start thinking Bethany Oratorio Society now. In the mid to late 1800s, it became really popular to have a community chorus. And community chorus popped up all throughout England in the mid to late 1800s. And even in Dublin, and I think the, the Dublin, the choir from Trinity College there um, started it. I don't even know how long ago, but in the, in the mid-1800s, mid to late-1800s. I was initially, I, I applied for a, a position at Trinity College for uh, the sabbatical, and uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't selected for it, but I was going to do a, um, a paper on Bethany Oratorio Society, the London Handel Society, and the Dublin Choral Society, because they all started around the same time. It's just that they took different paths. And now the London one is... It's totally professional. I mean, it's, it's all professional. The Dublin one is still college students. And then, of course, ours is community and college students. So, um, so this is a, um, a vocal rehearsal. And you can see that the conductor there is Mr. Costa. Remember that for when we get to the Bethany Oratorio Society. Here's uh, the Handel Festival at... Crystal Palace. So if you're an Anglophile like me, you know um, English soccer, English football. And Crystal Palace is one of the teams. And it's in London. So the, the Crystal Palace at the time, it doesn't exist anymore, but at the time was an enormous concert hall to the point where they would have 6,000 singers, 6,000 singers indoors and tens of thousands of people in the audience or maybe 6,000 performers, maybe not 6,000 singers, I think it's 6,000 performers. And so this is a, a rehearsal for that at the Crystal Palace. There's the seating chart for the Crystal Palace. If you can see it, it's, it's enormous. It's like our stage on steroids. I mean, it's just got a, a ton of things, so. Um, there were a lot of other performances in the mid to late 19th century. Um, the Crystal Palace used to do a triennial Handel Festival 
at the Crystal Palace, and that's the one that used thousands and thousands of performers. And that ran until 1926, and then petered out. Um, let's see here. Ah, this is the Strand Palace Hotel. And the only reason I'm showing you that is because that is on the exact spot where Exeter Hall existed in 1879. And as we kind of transition to the history of the Bethany Oratorio Society. Um, 1879 was when Dr. Olaf Olson, then at Rock Island, Augustana Rock Island, um, took a trip to Europe and was in London and got an inexpensive ticket. Was not, he didn't have a lot of money. So he wasn't, the, the Savoy Hotel, the really swanky Savoy Hotel is right across the street. And I'm sure he didn't stay there. Um, he, he probably stayed somewhere more modest. But he got a ticket, got an inexpensive ticket in the balcony, and an Englishman shared his music score with him. Okay? And uh, he was so transfixed by this. He was so moved that he wrote about it. And, and uh, just talking about uh, the, the, um, the clarity of the musicians and the powerful message. And you know, remember, this is the founder of Lindsborg, Kansas. Okay? Um, but now he's at Augustana Rock Island. So he was so moved, he brought it back to commencement at Augustana. So technically, Augustana College is one year older in the tradition than us, but they stopped doing it for a while. So we're the longest consecutive, we think, in North America. Um, so he brought it back to that commencement, and for whatever reason, um, Carl Swenson, Dr. Swenson, and his wife Alma were in the audience. And they said, huh? Yeah, for commencement. Yeah, that's when they did the performance. And uh, um, so he, he, Carl and, and Alma brought it back. They said, you know, we're founding this new college. You know, so that was 1879. It was 1881 that Bethany College was born on October 15th. And by December, they had already um, started rehearsals for the first performance of Handel's Messiah, or first five performances of Handel's Messiah. Okay, I might have missed some pictures here. That's Exeter Hall. That's Exeter Hall as it looked in 1879. And here's the inside of Exeter Hall. Okay. Who's that? Dr. Olson, Olaf Olson. Yep. So the original choir was made up of singers from Bethany Lutheran, Fremont, Assyria, and Salemsburg churches. Um, and I think they had, they, their goal was to have 100 singers, and I think they ended up with 75 or so the first year. Um, what I like, I like this quote from, um, I don't even, from Emery Lindquist. Messiah was to be identified with the daily life of the people. It was to become a part of them, an expression of their love for the beautiful. That's not bad, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, Alma Swenson was the main leader. Oh, I'm out of slides. Okay. Alma Swenson was the main musical leader in rehearsals, hosting sectionals at her house, and even getting on horseback and going around town and working with people individually on horseback, probably teaching them the first English that they ever learned. A lot, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm making some assumptions, but my assumption is that for a lot of people, Messiah was the first English they really learned. And that's, I think that's important and special. Hmm. Uh, the first rendition for the Bethany Oratorio Society was at Bethany Lutheran Church uh, at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, March 28. The conductor and the orchestra were brought from Augustana. Um, Alma could have done it, okay? She would have been just fine on her own, but, you know, it's 1882, right? So, um, so they brought in a conductor, and she needed to be the soprano soloist anyway. So... Separate programs were printed in English and Swedish. So here's how it went. Think about this for a holy week. Tuesday, March 28th, Bethany Lutheran Church. March 29th, 3 p.m., Salemsburg. 
March 30th, 8 p.m., Salina Opera House. March 31st, 8 p.m., McPherson Opera House. April 3rd, Fremont Lutheran Church. I mean, <laughs> this is what I want to see the reactions on their faces. Because if they had to sing five shows in a week, like of this, I mean, it's weird enough, you know, to people from the outside that we do Bach and Handel within two days of each other. You understand that, I hope, that it's not normal. We are not normal, <laughs> okay? But it's something to be proud of, so. Net proceeds were $224.25, which in today's money would be around $6,600. The money was helped to fund the new college. So over time, um, they grew to have more and more singers. And uh, it became a yearly tradition, of course. And the last time Dr. Olaf Olson heard it was in 1898. After number 22, Behold the Lamb of God, he stood and proclaimed to the entire room, thanks, my young friends, this is the heart of the oratorio. So he felt like number 22 was the, the heart of it. Um, that was the last time he heard it. I, someone in here knows. When did he die? Was it 1900, I think? I, I can't say for sure. Okay. Um, there were approximately 75 performers the first year, and a decade later it had grown to 102. From 1900 to 1935, there were times there were 500 members. The largest recorded membership was in 1923 with 609 performers. And by the way, the Lindsberg News Record reported that 758 applied, and they only kept 609. <laughs> we don't have that problem now, but, um, but we have the best singers. That's what we want. Right. Um, when Presser was built, they began to limit it to only 450 singers. Okay. In 1905, when the membership was 570, this is really interesting to me because I, it makes me wonder if it was mandated or voluntary because, um, what did I say, uh, 1905, membership was 570. 355 of the 570 were students and only 215 general citizens. By 1961, so even in 1961, there were 391 performers and 191 of them were students. Um, it's been sung every Holy Week with the exception of 1902, 1918, and 2020. You can guess, I don't, I don't know why in 1902, I think they did it at commencement, I think that's one of those they did, but you can guess why 1918 was postponed, right? Spanish flu? So we, uh, you know, almost, almost exactly 100 years apart, we went through the same things that they were going through, um, trying to get a performance in when there's, you know, a pandemic on. Before 1967, it was customary to have a recital of the soloists on Easter afternoon. Do you hear this? Soloists, the whole recital on Easter afternoon, and then do Messiah that night. After having already done Messiah on Palm Sunday, just saying, you know. And they did it for free. No, I'm just kidding. They didn't really. They didn't really. Um, I think it was 2013. I came in 2014. I think 2013, you'll, you'll know this better than me because I wasn't here. But I think 2013 was the year that we stopped doing Palm Sunday Messiah performances. This the year before I came? Two years? 2012? Two, okay. Um, uh, when America was engaged in the decisive phase of World War II, the Office of War Information in 1945 transcribed the Messiah at Lindsborg for transmission to troops overseas. I didn't know this until I, until I read it on sabbatical. That, uh, yeah, they transcribed it and, and in 1945 did it overseas and to the population of European countries. It was meant to illustrate the fine quality of life among free people in a small rural community in America. So, some important things happen here. Uh, the longest serving conductors Let's see if we can make guesses. Who's the top? Brassi, okay. Brassi from 1915 to 1946, so 31 years. Who's second? Elmer Copley, 
1960 to 1988. And here's the one that you're not going to get. Who's third? No, not Esper. Let's say this. I, I think it was one of his relatives who um, was on music faculty when I was at Bethany and taught me trumpet lessons. Yeah. No, Samuel Thorstenberg. Mm -hmm. Samuel Thorstenberg is from 1898 to 1909. That's 11 years. And then Dan Moran and I are tied for fourth. So, so what are some conclusions that I brought from this? Remember, I was going to look for an edition. I was going to look and say, okay, well, we'll do the Peters edition or the Novello edition or whatever, because that fits us. Well, nothing fits us, okay? We do our own thing. And what I was, I've always felt this way, but I was on, on sabbatical when I met with all these experts. I mean, I got to meet with some really important experts. Um, Donald Burroughs, like I said, and uh, Desmond Early from Dublin, who conducts the Chamber Choir of Ireland, and all these people, and I, I kept saying, okay, this is our tradition, you know, but, and I want to move forward, and I want to be progressive, but I also want to honor our tradition. Because think about it, if we started to do it with 32 singers, that's not us, right? That's just not us. And so um, what I decided was, um, what I decided was we should do our own edition, electronic edition, that includes both the orchestration that we use right now for the choruses and the original orchestration for the solos, but still have also do an electronic edition of the Rejoice in 12.8 and also do it of How Beautiful with the different settings. And just to have it so that this year we're going to do this version and next year we're going to do this version. We're always going to keep the, the um, you know, we're always going to turn that organ up. Maybe not quite as loud as Tyler turned it up yesterday. <laughs> I don't know if you all noticed that. Woo! I, I, finally, I, finally I went like, just back off a little bit. When the floor is shaking, it's, it's too loud, so. Um, I told every person I talked to, I spoke about our tradition, and every one of them, every one of them said, oh, that is so great. That's a great tradition. You should keep doing that tradition. And I was like, well, uh, yes. <laughs> but, I was, but I was trying to figure out, you know, what edition we should do. So. But they encouraged me to do the same edition, the same, basically, that, that we've been doing, because that's what we do. Right? It's, it's, it's special for Lindsborg. Um, so I say, said, my suggestion is to create an electronic edition that has options for the conductor to choose from. For example, the chorus could, could still be big and use modern performing forces, while the solos could be done with original forces. You know, so, all right. Questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah, David. You know, one thing I didn't even put, not overtly, not like Bach. Um, what did I do with my glasses? Yeah, can't see you guys very well when I'm not wearing my glasses. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Haydn, the creation. <laughs> um, but no, he, I mean, he didn't write the text. He didn't choose the text. Um, a man named Charles Jennings chose the text, and in fact, Jennings was not real happy with the, with the work. He, he, he wrote the text. He was, Handel em, employed him to write the, or to collect the texts and stuff, and, and, then he, uh, and then he said it, but he didn't, he didn't plan any of the text. So I, 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 I can't say that he wasn't religious. I would think anybody at that time probably went to church, um, especially musicians, but otherwise I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you know what the um, result was of him forming an opera company in London? Yep. It's the Royal Opera. That was that was Handel. He started it. So. Yeah. Other questions. Yep.
Well, Donald Burroughs is like uh, really well known around the world. He's done his own edition. He's written books. He's written like the book for Cambridge Press on Handel's Messiah and stuff. And he doesn't like to use email. And he's probably in his 80s. He teaches at uh, oh the Open University, I think it is, in London. And he's a professor there. And uh, but he's kind of a recluse a little bit, and he doesn't see people a lot. But he has connections at the Foundling Museum. And so I talked to them and I said, hey, can you slip him my number and just see, you know, if he, if he would be willing to let me buy him a cup of coffee? And I just forgot about it. You know, and a, a week later, I'm in my Airbnb, you know, and I'm watching TV or working on the computer or something, and, and I get a phone call. Hi, this is Donald Burroughs. And I'm, oh my gosh, you know. And so uh, he said, I'm going to Paris tomorrow. If you want to meet me at the train, we can sit down and have coffee for a little while. So I did. And it, I, I still to this day think that he, um, he only wanted me there because I watched his bags while he went and got lunch. <laughs> you take what you can get. I mean, no, we met, we met, um, we met outside the British Library. There's a nice, nice area there. And it was, it was you know, a nice day. And so we met outside there. And, and talked, and, and I asked him everything about, you know, do you think there were French horns, you know? Is it sin of the world or sins of the world? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you something. It's both. It is. Handel himself wrote sin in, in the original, but sins in other ones. This is, this is why, like, I came back with a new perspective, because if you're looking for the definitive edition of Handel's Messiah, there is none. There is none. Okay? It doesn't exist, the definitive edition. There's, this, there's the Foundling edition, and there's the Peter's edition, and there's, but really there's no one edition. The one that is done the most is the Watkins Shaw version. You've probably seen it with an orange cover. Um, that's the one that's done most. Um, but uh, th that doesn't fit our orchestration, our current orchestration. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's the originals. Yeah, no kidding. It's 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 really like, it's that's what they were saying. They were like, this needs to be on display somewhere. Well, I thought about I thought about if 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 they would display it, then I would give it to them on loan indefinitely until you know for a decade or something like that. But I don't know that they'll, they would use it like that. We're going back. The whole choir is going to the Foundling Museum and going to get to see all this stuff. They took copies of it. I mean, I owned them. So it, 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 they just happened that it slipped through their fingers. So... I think probably. Well, you know, money's no object for me, so. $35. Richard. No. Well, I mean, not, not beats per minute. Oh, for sure. For sure. But, but that's what, you know, what I tell a lot of people is that you have to, it's right, I, I did this naturally, and then I got confirmation that this is how he would have probably done it, that you just do with what you have. If, you're, if your orchestra can play it this fast, but your chorus can't sing it that fast, well, then you take it at a different tempo. If the orchestra can't play it that fast, but the chorus can't, you take it at the tempo that is right for for the ensemble. So I think he wrote things like grave and things like that, but not beats per minute. Those are, uh, let's, listen, some of the editors over the years have been just horrible. Some of the editors changed some of his grammar. You know, they said, oh, he's not an originally um, an English speaker, so he doesn't understand grammar. And there are times when you go, yeah, maybe he didn't. But uh, too many people have changed too many things over the years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, well, the, the best thing for me was getting that book and, and being able to spend a couple days with, their, with all of their materials. Because I, before that, I had not seen all of those other editions. Because if you're going to buy all the editions, that's going to really add up to a lot of money. And so um, we didn't own all of the editions, so I got to see those. As far as someone learning something from me, that was probably when I was in line to see the Queen's casket. So I, and and I, this, is a, this is a good enough story to tell you. Um, we, uh, I, I decided, I, I put it on Facebook, the Queen had died, and I was there, and you could queue up for, in my case, seven hours. And that was the least amount of time I ever saw anyone. I've got a picture. They used to run a, a thing on YouTube that was a, a, a map of the line where it currently stood. And they would tell you how long it was. The next day at exactly the same time that I had gone the day before, it was a 24-hour wait. And people did it. So everybody, everybody in Lindsborg said on Facebook, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. We're living through you. And I'm like, ah. I mean, the casket wasn't open. I don't even know if she was in there. <laughs> but so, so we got in line, and immediately, immediately, a guy started talking to me. And he says, oh, you're a music teacher. Well, what kind of music are you like? You know what? I really love Mahler. And he goes, I love Mahler, too. And the guy in front of us turned around and said, I like Mahler. <laughs> and it turns out that the guy in front of us and his wife and another couple and Tony and I got to be really good friends over seven hours. <laughs> we really did. I mean, so, but here's the, the crazy part of this story. About two hours in, my friend Trudy, Trudy and Brian, Trudy says, so have you ever been to London before? And I said, well, I used to come here on a trip with high school students back in the 90s, and uh, we would spend three days here and then go three days in Paris. And she said, is it Voyagers International? And I said, how did you know that? She said, well, I'm a tour guide, and I used to give tours for Voyagers International. I said, well, we might know some of the same people. Have you ever heard of Vernon Nicholson? She said, well, I was always on his bus. And I said, I was always on his bus. <laughs> so I literally had been on a bus for a tour of London with Trudy in 1995. And I've hired her to be our tour guide when we go back. So... Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Mm hmm Yep. Yeah, they would do, uh, but it was a Handel festival, so it would it would be all Handel. It just wouldn't be all Messiah. So Israel and Egypt, Judas Maccabeus, things like that. Selections from there. Yes. Uh, it, it was really common at the time for someone else to choose the libretto and, to, and to, to give it to him. And so Charles Jennings was the one that, like I said, he ended up not real happy with the final product. Um, but what's he going to do? It, it became popular in 1749, 1750, and there's not much he could do. Oh, Charles Jennings was just a librettist that uh, that, that uh, did more than one thing for Handel, but this is the main one. Yeah, David. Mm -mm. At least not in any of the stuff I saw. Uh, I don't think he would have left. He probably would have left his stuff to relatives instead of the Foundling Hospital if. If he did have relatives, so. yeah. You're the one that teaches music history. <laughs> I don't remember. I I, I don't remember. Um, yeah, Julianne. Ah, yes. The okay. I'm going to get this wrong. Prussia. Went, went to, became the king of England, and that's why he was brought, because it was, I think it was Hamburg that he lived um, before then. Well, there's Halle. Halle was his hometown, but then he worked in Hamburg for a while, and uh, left Hamburg with Schmidt 
to come work for the king and would keep coming back. And finally, the king said, you just need to stay. I remember that now. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that's passed through this brain that I, I don't always remember at the drop of a hat. I'm getting old. So, yeah. No, nope. the only only stuff I found was the stuff that Charles Jennings the, in the original. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know when King James was, but so they would have come up with this in 1739, 1740 was when they were communicating with each other about Handel trying to recruit him to send his texts and thing, things like that. And of course, then he got it, and he did it in 24 days, so, um, yeah. Julianne, oh, she's not raising her hand. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't think Handel, I don't think it's a stretch to say Handel didn't have any specific thing saying, this is how I want it. I mean, he changed things so much that um, the chorus sizes that he had in his lifetime were not the 500 singer versions. Okay, he, he always used a smaller chorus, probably between 30 and 50 singers total. Yeah, well, in the beginning, some of the found, by, by the foundling hospital, he's starting to go blind, and, uh, and so he w wasn't uh, conducting a lot of those performances. But he was always there. So, all right. Oh yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they had four performances to get out of the way before the Easter performance. So, um, yeah, they did. They did a, a, a lot of that. Yes, oh, at the first, first performance, Olaf Olsen was the organist. Dan? <laughs> Can you tell us about the radio um, performance this Sunday? He's got to get up out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them about the radio performance, where it's going to be. Well, we're going to be uh, live streaming both the, the Bach and the Handel. Um, that's going to be via College Live. Uh, it's posted off the web page of mu.edu. And the little button up in the right-hand corner says live streaming. So those two events are live streaming. Uh, ASAL is, is still working with us to do a live broadcast as well. Uh, but it's going to be streaming and handled through the Right, so what is it, 15, what's, what's KSAL? 1150, 1150 KSAL, yeah. But it will be live streamed. That doesn't mean you shouldn't buy a ticket. <laughs> or you can, you can um, send in a donation to help support your local oratorio society. Yeah, it'll, it's, it's, it's posted to YouTube after it's done here, but you can always still access it. The, the web page is www.bethanylb, as in Lindsborg, bethanylb.edu slash live. If you just go there, there's, there's, also, there's last year's Messiah performance on there, I think. Yeah. Oh. Maybe I should do that before I. I think I think the book's value. I think the book's yeah right it's like going to see the Queen, which by the way on choir tour we will be in London during the coronation. Yeah, well yeah it's cool except 
hotel rooms went from 129 a night to 300 a night. So a 12 passenger van for a day is a thousand bucks. So we're going to be spending that day walking a lot. <laughs> so, well, if there's no other questions, yeah, Dean. Handle. Yeah. The, no. Right. Oh, you meant in Sweden. I, I didn't do a lot of... Um, oh, in England, they said handle. I mean, they probably didn't say it like me, handle. But, you know. Well, thank you so much to each of you for coming out tonight. And, uh, yeah. And... I want to say, I want to acknowledge uh, the Lindsberg Arts Council and the Greater Salina Community Foundation and what's the Smoky Valley Community Foundation. These people all sponsored me, along with Bethany College, by the way. So thank you very much to Bethany College for allowing me the time and the ability to, to do these things. It was a really great time. It was a, it was a wonderful time. The only thing was being away from family that long. Uh, but... Uh, I spent a month in Dublin, two weeks in London, and six weeks in Stockholm. And it was, uh, and I got a lot done in each place, but uh, the main research for Handel was in Ireland and England. So. Anyway, thank you, and there are cookies still. Please go get some cookies. No, no, they did it in 1918. They just did it. They just did it in, in May. Yeah, they did it during commencement. Yeah. If you have a second one, I would love it. Okay. If you don't mind, I'll take it. Oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs>